This is Professor Russell James coming to you from Texas Tech University. Welcome to today's lecture from Visual Plan Giving, an introduction to the law and taxation of charitable gift planning. Welcome to The Secret to Understanding Plan Giving, Part 3, Motivations for Financial Advisors. This is Professor Russell James. In the previous lecture, we have been looking at plan giving from the perspective of the fundraiser and the nonprofit organization. However, plan giving can be useful not just for fundraisers, but also for financial advisors. Some financial advisors may sell life insurance products, in which case the variety of transactions involving life insurance, discussed in later lectures, will be of direct interest. Even for those financial advisors who are compensated solely as a percentage of assets under management, understanding charitable planning can be an important proficiency. Well-informed financial advisors can become more attractive to clients with significant charitable interests by providing dramatic planning benefits. Such clients are often those with substantial wealth, making them particularly attractive for the financial advisor. Additionally, a variety of charitable planning techniques, such as charitable remainder trusts, private foundations, and donor-advised funds, allow advisors to continue to manage the funds within the charitable instrument, sometimes for multiple generations. In many cases, these funds are undiminished by the otherwise common effects of capital gains taxes, income taxes on earnings, estate taxes, and division among heirs, resulting in greater assets under management. Charitable planning expertise can be particularly useful for financial advisors who wish to work with wealthier clients. As wealth increases, the tendency to engage in charitable planning also increases. Thus, this body of knowledge is particularly useful in attracting and benefiting the higher wealth clients that are so often sought after by financial advisors. A financial advisor might use this knowledge as a means of marketing his or her services. This can be done formally through the offering of seminars, perhaps to the significant donors or board members of a local charity. It can also be done informally through conversations. Simply learning that a person has made a significant gift, often easily identified by various donor recognition levels, can lead to a conversation over whether the gift was of cash or appreciated securities, and an explanation of the relative benefits of gifting appreciated securities through the, quote, charitable swap technique. Providing such value to prospective clients can be a good first step to establishing a relationship as an advisor. Helping clients to take advantage of the tax benefits available through charitable planning can benefit financial advisors not only by demonstrating the value of their advice to clients, but also by increasing the client's assets under management. Take the example of a client who holds a highly appreciated asset that generates little or no income. Such occurrences are quite frequent as those who build significant wealth often do so by owning relatively illiquid businesses or properties. At some point, the client may wish to convert this non-income producing asset to an income generating asset. The standard approach to such a conversion is to simply sell the asset and use the proceeds to purchase another asset that generates more income. However, if the client already has interest in leaving a charitable gift at death, this may not be the best approach. Instead of selling the asset and paying the resulting capital gains taxes, the client could transfer the asset to a charitable remainder trust allow the trust to sell the asset and then receive income for life from the trust, with the remainder going to a charity at death. This charitable approach not only avoids the capital gain taxes, the charitable remainder trust is a charitable entity and thus pays no taxes upon the sale of the appreciated asset, but also generates an immediate income tax deduction. Such dual tax benefits can significantly increase the amount of funds available to be managed by the financial advisor. 
During the client's life, the financial advisor can manage the funds in the Charitable Remainder Trust, including those as assets under management subject to the advisor's normal management fees. Further, the charitable recipient at the client's death could be the client's own private family foundation, with assets also managed by the same advisor. Taking the example of a $1 million asset with no basis, the traditional sell and reinvest strategy would net $722,000 in the typical state with the roughly 5% state capital gains net tax. The federal tax deduction for payment of state taxes usually provides little or no help because of the $10,000 cap and high standard deductions. In a higher taxation state, such as California, such a sale may result in only $629,000 left to invest. That is $1 million gain subject to 13.3% top rate in California and 23.8% top federal rate. Contrast this with the Charitable Remainder Trust, where the entire $1 million remains after the sale, available to be invested and managed by the financial advisor. Additionally, such a transaction will generate an income tax deduction of at least $100,000, increasing the assets under management outside of the Charitable Remainder Trust by reducing tax payments. Depending upon the state income tax rates, this tax deduction may be worth nearly $50,000 or even more. Thus, charitable planning results in assets under management of $1,050,000 or more instead of only $722,000 or even $629,000. Clearly, this is no small difference for the client and the advisor. In addition to the increase in assets under management resulting from avoidance of capital gains taxes and generation of income tax benefits, charitable planning can also increase assets under management by providing for tax-free growth environments. Over time, investments that grow without taxation will accumulate much more rapidly than their regularly taxed counterparts, leading to greater assets under management. A simple version of such tax-free growth is available with a donor-advised fund. Money transferred to a donor-advised fund must eventually be given to a charity, although at present there are no time restrictions on when this would occur. In the meantime, the financial advisor can take fees for managing the funds and the funds can grow without taxation because the account is a charitable account. Similarly, charitable remainder trusts pay no taxes on investment income. Like a traditional IRA, taxation occurs only when funds are removed from the charitable remainder trust. Assets within a private foundation do not grow entirely tax-free, but the tax rate is only 1% or 2%, making them almost tax-free. Creating multi-generational charitable entities, such as private foundations, can also increase the length of time that a particular financial advising firm will be able to manage the funds. In the typical estate scenario, the death of the client results in the loss of all assets under management. First, the wealth is reduced through estate taxation, and then it is divided into smaller pools corresponding with the number of heirs. This creates a situation where the advisor either cannot or would prefer not to continue as the asset manager. Continuing to manage the assets would require having relationships with each of the heirs stronger than those of their other potential financial advisors. Even if such connections were possible, the advisor is faced with managing more relationships for smaller pools of money. At a minimum, the time, commitment, and hassle for the financial advisor is significantly multiplied. Realistically, the funds will likely leave the advisor's management upon the death of the client. However, if the client had established, during life and through estate planning, a multi-generational charitable entity, the advisor is in a much stronger position. The charitable pool of funds is undiminished by either estate taxation or division among heirs. The advisor's existing role as charitable asset manager places him or her in a strong position to continue in that role after the death of the client. 
rather than having to be the top choice for each individual heir, the advisor need only be acceptable to the majority of those appointed by the deceased client. Further, managing charitable funds is often much easier than managing personal accounts. Losses to the charitable entity tend to be less personally distressing than losses from one's own investments. Such a dispassionate management scenario often reduces the amount of personal coaching and hand-holding necessary during inevitable market fluctuations making the asset management that much easier for the financial advisor. This lecture series will explore a wide variety of charitable planning techniques. The tax and financial consequences of many of these techniques can become quite complex. There is no need to despair in the face of such seemingly unending minutia. Instead, remember the simple secrets to plan giving. Plan giving can do two things reduce taxes, and trade a gift for income. Fundraisers should use it for two main reasons, to ask from the big bucket of assets rather than the small bucket of cash, and to work with donors who say the magic phrase, I wish I could do more, but... Financial advisors should use it for two different main reasons, to provide dramatic benefit to highly desirable clients and to increase multi-generational assets under management. This has been The Secret to Understanding Plan Giving with Professor Russell James.